with regards to this practice that we're engaging in, it's natural that all of us, all practitioners, wish to know and understand the Dhamma. And we want this to happen quickly as well. And that's something that's very natural for people who engage in the practice of Dhamma to want to, to get results fast. But this wish for speedy uh, fruits of the practice is a form of tanha, of desire that's arising. But if we think about it, then if we don't have any desire, if there's no tanha at all, then how are we going to practice? But if we have a lot of this desire and we want very quick results, then it will just make things a mess. So we need to have a sense of enoughness, of getting things in proportion. And this is this requires us to use our wisdom faculty and to be able to let go as we practice. Because it's natural that when we engage in meditation, we're not going to experience peace every single day. And some days our minds will be quite frantic and chaotic. And other days they may experience a very deep sense of calm. We may feel this profound peace for many days, but then it just goes and it doesn't come back for weeks at a time. So we need to have an understanding of the nature of practice as well, and also to have panya um, instructing and leading our hearts. Even though many different feelings uh, can be present in the mind, um, we still carry on with the practice, independent of how lazy or enthusiastic we may feel. We still sit meditation, do walking meditation. For the monks, we try to keep the standards of um, the monastery and of our teacher well, and keep the monastic routine. Do this strictly so that we become strong. Whether we are staying in a community or we're staying by ourselves, then we do chanting every single day. And it's good to come together to chant because there's a certain power that comes from that, this power of harmony. So whether it's external practice or internal practice, really what we're doing is training our hearts. And we carry on with this, even though sometimes there may not be much peace arising we still engage in this practice every single day. And one day we will have to meet with peace. It may start off as just being a small amount and maybe the mind gathers together um, and it can gather together at different points in the body. So it may be the tip of the nose or the forehead or the heart area and it feels very compact at that point. And also cool, like there's maybe um, a cool mist at that point. The heart feels uh, refreshed, like we're sitting in um, a cool room and feeling very at ease. So this mind that is gathered together, that's firm and stable, is conducive to the practice of contemplation. For us to be able to see into the nature of the mind um, and to give rise to this uh, knowing nature, the one that knows. So the question sometimes arises, is it possible to just be mindful, and stay with the one who knows. And it is. That's a valid way of practicing, if we can do it. 
But if we try to practice in that way and stay with this one that knows, and it's just not there, then that means that it's not going well. And what will probably happen is the mind will just go off and start thinking and proliferating. In that case, instead of being with the one that knows, we're with the one that is deluded because the heart is um, murky. It doesn't see clearly at that time. So we need to come back and train our minds, teach and instruct our hearts in the practice of um, inner cultivation. A way that we can raise up and establish this inner knowing is through the meditation mantra of Buddha. So we build up um, the one that knows through reciting Buddha, which is essentially the recollection of the Buddha. The Buddha was the one who knew, the awakened one, the joyful one. If the mind is still, then this meditation mantra will naturally disappear by itself. And that's because the mind is just present with the one that knows. And in this state, we're very capable in uh, the ways of taking care and nurturing our hearts. Venerable Ajahn Chah had a teaching, an analogy that he used. And it was a very intelligent and uh, interesting way of teaching. He said that it's like we're sitting in our home and there's just one chair there in our house and we're the ones sitting on it. And various guests come in the door to visit us, but they've got nowhere to sit. So they just come in and then they leave. There's no place for them to stay because we're taking that chair. And so this is just like us having this inner knowing, this the one who knows taking care of our hearts is the same as us sitting on this chair. The visitors are like the various moods and emotions that come into the heart. And because um, there is this knowing nature, then they just can't stay. Because we have mindfulness there, uh, looking after our hearts. Also, if there's any, um, if we perceive any sights or sounds, smells, tastes, touches as well, then these aren't able to do or affect our hearts in any way because we have this inner awareness and knowing present. But if the mind isn't looked after by this inner awareness, then we'll leave that seat and the guests will be able to come in and have a, a sit down, which means that all of these Ramanas, these um, sense objects are able to enter into our hearts. So therefore, we need to train ourselves in mindfulness and um, raising up and cultivating the one that knows. And it's a very good practice for us to do. But if we're finding that difficult, then we just come back and stay with this mantra of Buddha. So therefore, in the beginning of the practice, it's okay for us to just be aware of our hearts. We can do that because that's one of the practices in the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, to have mindfulness over the mind. But if we're able to practice in that way, what that means is that we've got a lot of wisdom already and our samadhi is strong and we can maintain it um, constantly. It's not like, sorry, if we don't have that um, strength of samadhi, then we just won't be able to 
keep a watch over our minds to a sufficient degree to engage in this way of practice. And it's just like if um, a businessman were to start up a new business and it was a very large undertaking, then they would need a huge amount of funds in order to be able to do that. And if they just didn't have the enough money, then they wouldn't be able to start up a business like that. And so, therefore, if we're going to undertake this practice of just being aware of our minds, then we need a lot of uh, mindfulness present. We also need a great amount of samadhi. And um, like having the funds, enough funds to start up this business is like us having enough um, stability of our hearts, of our minds being collected together and gathered inwards so that they're very strong and stable. If our samadhi is sufficient, then we'll be able to look into the mind and know whether greed, hatred, and illusion is present or whether it's not there. When any of these defilements um, enter the mind, we'll be able to see them as they arise. Our mindfulness will be swift enough to know that, to know them as they come up, to see them arise last and then cease. To see all of these things as just being an object of the mind, whether it's any feelings that we have or any proliferation that goes on, we'll see it arise and be able to watch it right until it ceases. We'll know all of these things as they're happening and see them clearly within our, within our own minds. Whether the mind is present, whether the defilements are present in the mind or whether they're absent, then we'll know that. And this shows that our wisdom faculty is already very highly developed. Be able to see that any feelings we experience are just impermanent phenomena that arise, last, and cease. There's no abiding self to them. It's just the mind. The mind is merely the mind. And the mind is not self. If we take the mind as being, a self, or as being me or mine, that shows that avicca or ignorance is still present and active in our hearts, because we've gone and attached to the mind as being a self. But if we have wisdom there, and we're able to understand the truth, then we'll see that the mind is not there's not self, and there won't be any suffering arising. Um, due to that insight. So in order to be able to look into the mind and contemplate just the mind, our samadhi needs to be very firm and we need to be very well practiced at it already. To be able to reflect on the mental factors in a way that gives rise to wisdom this is a very high stage of uh, panya already. And the Buddha practiced in this way. He was able to see that Dhamma's phenomena arise because of a cause. And see that phenomena is just phenomena. It's merely that. And this is what allowed him to attain to becoming the perfectly self-awakened Buddha. So for us to give rise to the one that knows, a good method is to look into our bodies and also into the Vedana, into feeling. If we already have some degree of samadhi, then it's a valid practice for us to look and cultivate uh, this practice of investigation of Vedana, of feelings, whether they are pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, or neutral feelings, we see them there and understand them. See that 
the feelings of the body as well, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. But if uh, samadhi is insufficient for this practice, then we come back and be mindful of the breathing process of the breath as it comes in and as, as it leaves. We can recite uh, buddho or dhammo or sangho, um, whatever works to bring our minds to calm and to peace. When they're in this um, stable and energized state, then we turn the mind to contemplate into the body in a manner that um, allows us to see clearly. So we can investigate the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, nails, teeth, and skin. These things that cover over our bodies. And if we just look at them normally with our physical eyes, then we'll see these things as being beautiful. When new monks take ordination, then this is what we're taught on um, that day by our preceptor. We're taught these five kamatana of hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, and taught to see them as being unattractive. So we can take up just one of those and look into it. So like our head hair, is that really beautiful? Well, supposing that we had a pot of curry and just one strand of hair fell into that curry, then that just that would be enough to make the whole thing dirty. And we wouldn't want to eat it anymore. It will lose all its value just from one strand of hair. So our bodies are like this. They're really unattractive things. And the other parts as well, the nails, the teeth, the skin, they're the same. If we don't take constant care of our bodies and clean them all the time, then they quickly become dirty. So we always need to be washing ourselves in order to try and um, keep them kind of bearable and livable. So we contemplate to see this unattractive nature of physicality. And we can be mindful of or mindfully investigate any of the 32 parts of the body to see them as unattractive, as asuba. If we do this well, then our minds will be cool and will feel peace as a result of this practice. And this is one method to bring our minds to calm. If there isn't much peace, then we won't be able to see into the inconstant nature of the body. But really, if we look into um, the body well, enough to be able to contemplate into anicca, then we'll be able to see that it's just a heap of elements that breaks apart. And these concepts of being beautiful or unattractive aren't valid at that point because we see that there's no self there. We perceive into anatta and can see everything as being empty. From this emptiness, then our inner nature of awakening is realized. But we have to come back to this, these basic practices and ask ourselves what it is that we're attached to. And it's very likely that we'll be attached to these bodies as being beautiful. So we need to take up the meditation objects that allow us to see that they really aren't beautiful. This will calm down our minds and collect them together, bring them into a state of samadhi. So this is one way that we can look into the body, contemplate the body. And as we develop the practice until we're skilled at it, then we'll be able to see into the nature of anicca, dukkha, anatta, of inconstancy, stress, and not self, um, throughout the body. If we can do this with clarity, then we'll experience emptiness and we'll be able to let go. For those of us who are very skilled at wisdom, then we can just try uh, contemplating letting go. 
seeing that if we attach to anything, that will be a cause of us to suffer. So we tell ourselves that it's better not to attach because we don't want to feel that pain. There was one time that Venerable Ajahn Chah went to England and there was a man who was staying at one of the monasteries there who was an artist, a painter. And he was painting a, or drawing a picture of Venerable Ajahn Chah. And he felt very joyful doing this and thinking that he was going to finish up this picture and um, offer it to Ajahn Chah. And it was a very beautiful picture. So Ajahn Chah came to the monastery and he knew the joy and the fullness of heart that um, that this artist was feeling um, because of you know, painting this picture of, of this great teacher. But instead of just following along with that emotion, that feeling of joy that the artist was feeling, instead Ajahn Chah asked him, well, if I took a sharp knife and I slashed this painting, how would you feel then? So instead of just following this artist's emotions, he, he asked this question instead. But the artist was actually quite mindful. His, his mind was quick enough to realize that he would suffer if that happened. He had already gone and attached very strongly to that painting that he was working on. But when he heard this teaching, then he was able to let go of that attachment. And this uh, was a cause for wisdom to arise. And just this one teaching that Ajahn Chah gave him allowed him to uh, give rise to wisdom and for that wisdom to become a cause for samadhi to become even more firmly established in his heart. But if we only develop samadhi and there's no wisdom there at all, then we won't be able to get ourselves out of suffering. So sometimes wisdom can come up very clearly. And it's important for us to get and develop our panya faculty to this point. There was another time that... I was staying at Wat Nambapong at Ajahn Chah's monastery and I was attending on my teacher there. And there was a woman who came in from the city and she was uh, quite attractive and um, had makeup on and lipstick. And she praised Ajahn Chah very highly and said that he's like a white elephant in the forest. A white elephant being something that's very rare and uh, valuable. But there was a novice who was sitting next to Ajahn Chah at that time. And he was a very naughty boy. And uh, he acted like a monkey often. So Ajahn Chah responded that there aren't just white elephants in the forest. There are also monkeys here as well. So he was quick-witted in that way. He was able to respond like this. And we can take this teaching and reflect on these bodies as well, that there aren't just beautiful things here, but there are also dirty things like blood. So he was very fast, and his wisdom was sharp. And he was just like a Zen master in the northeast of Thailand, someone who had very strong discernment. So for us, we should contemplate in this way. And this will be enough to give rise to the one that knows in our hearts. Whether we're feeling lazy or whether we're feeling energetic, we carry on with the practice just the same. Looking after our hearts, taking care of them, until we're able to touch into emptiness. So really give this practice your best shot. Try it out and uh, develop it every day. And may you all grow in blessings.